Welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me, the show that brings you a comprehensive look into the complex field of dizziness. Now here are your hosts, vestibular physical therapist, Dr. Abby Ross and Dr. Danielle Tate. Welcome back to Talk Dizzy to Me. I'm Dr. Abby Ross, vestibular physical therapist, neurologic clinical specialist, and I'm joined this episode and every episode by Dr. Danielle Tate, also a vestibular physical therapist. So, you know, we really have to start today with an apology because after listening back to our last few episodes, we realized we actually might have jumped the gun a little bit. We are podcast rookies over here and (laughs) we just kind of dove in. We were so excited to nerd out and we figure we need to backpedal a little bit. Just a little bit. So today we're going to take it back to the basics. Basics as in what the heck is your vestibular system? How does it affect your everyday life? Yes, that is a great place to start. The vestibular system is very small, but also very mighty. The crazy thing is that most people don't even know they have a vestibular system until, of course, something goes wrong. This is so true. I can't tell you the number of patients or clients that feel a bit of relief just by talking to someone who understands what's happening. Once you explain to them what their vestibular system does, why they're experiencing their symptoms, what their course of recovery is going to look like or what we expect it to look like, you know, vertigo is a really scary thing. So a little education can go a long way. I completely agree. And you can almost see them begin to relax once the mystery of the vestibular system is broken down for them. It's almost like a light bulb moment goes off in their head. And I'm also really excited to take this opportunity to explain what the vestibular system is so my friends and family know exactly what I'm working with and what I'm doing. Because usually they just nod yes and smile and pretend to know. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So what is your vestibular system? It's this really small, tiny organ that sits inside your skull. So this is your inner ear. There are three different parts of your ear. There's your outer ear. This is your ear canal up to your eardrum. This is where you can place a tooth, uh, a Q-tip, not a toothpick, highly not recommended. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Then you've got your middle ear. This is uh, where you have ear infections, where your hearing bones are located, uh, where you might sometimes feel some fullness or drainage uh, down from that, that that middle ear. And then you have your inner ear. This is inside your skull. This is surrounded by some of the toughest bone in your body. And it's really, really tiny. This inner ear is also called your vestibular apparatus or vestibular organ. There's a little idea of just how small this organ is. This is a true to size print, a 3D print of a vestibular organ. So it's, it's if you're at home, it's just about the size of a dime or so. Yeah, it's super tiny. And in that visual, if you're on the YouTube channel, you can see it compared to Danny's nail there. Really, really small, but once again, mighty. Small, but mighty. Exactly. So the vestibular system plays a major role in your everyday life. How? Well, your vestibular system detects head movement, side to side movement, up and down movement, tilt to tilt movement, any way you move your head, your vestibular system detects it. And with this, your vestibular system plays a massive role in your balance, for one, two, gaze stability or your ability to move while still keeping a clear picture, and three, spatial orientation, recognizing where you are in space. A really great way to visualize gaze stability, being able to move while keep a clear picture, is imagine walking or running around with a video camera and then trying to watch the video afterwards. You know, it looks really shaky. It's hard to watch. You might get a little motion sickness. The Blair Witch Project is coming to mind. Uh, (laughs) How come, if that's what we're recording, how come we're not seeing that? Uh, When you're moving around, that inner ear then communicates to your eyeballs, all six muscles around your eyes, and will contract and relax them to act as stabilizers. So your eyes stay in place, focused on a clear picture. That's why everything looks so easy and steady to us while we're walking around. But let's also touch on on balance really quick. You have three systems that contribute to your balance. Your vestibular system is one, as we just mentioned. Also your visual system and your somatosensory system. And that somatosensory system is the information you receive through your skin, muscles, joints, uh, primarily like the feeling in your feet or your ankles. Um, standing on a squishy surface might feel really, really different than standing on a hardwood floor. Standing on a hard, 
uh, or a hard surface might be a lot easier to balance than if you were standing on a foam cushion or something squishy. Walking on soft sand at the beach is also more challenging than walking on a track. Right. So these three systems work together, your vision, your vestibular system, and your somatosensory system, but they don't always agree. So think about when you are sitting at, with your foot on the brake, hopefully, at a red light, and the car next to you starts to move. It just starts to creep forward a little bit. For a quick second, you might panic thinking you're moving because your vision is sensing movement. Even though your vision is sensing movement, though, your somatosensory system is telling you, nope, you're just sitting here in the same place that you started. In this case, it's your third system that contributes to your balance, your vestibular system that rules the roost and lets you know it's the car next to you that actually started to move, not you. So, okay, let's give an example here on how the vestibular system detects head movement. There are two aspects to your vestibular apparatus, the semicircular canals, which detect angular movement. This is like shaking your head no or nodding your head yes and the otolith organs, which detect linear movement, kind of like accelerating or decelerating in a car or going up and down in an elevator. Yeah, so let's break this down a little bit further. If you were to rotate your head to the right, your right vestibular system, specifically the right horizontal semicircular canal, will send an excitatory message to your brain. While your left horizontal semicircular canal will send an equal and opposite inhibitory message to your brain. So your right is excitatory when you move your head to the right, your left is inhibitory. And then your brain can interpret the messages and says, okay, John Doe, you just turned your head this far, this fast, and this is how you need to adjust your body in order to maintain your balance. And this is how you need to adjust your eyes in order to maintain clear vision. That's right. And the other semicircular canals detect different head movements because they're located in different planes in relation to each other. So you have six semicircular canals all together, three on the left, three on the right. You have a horizontal canal, an anterior or superior canal, and a posterior canal. Okay, so that's the semicircular canals, angular movement. Moving on to the otolith organs, the utricle and saccule, which detect linear motion. Think, like Danny said, the initiation or termination of a movement in a straight line, going up and down in an elevator or starting and stopping in a car. So for the sake of this particular episode, we're just going to talk about one other aspect of the vestibular apparatus anatomy, and that is the otoconia, also known as the calcium carbonate crystals. And if you've heard anything about the vestibular system, it's probably this. Yes, this is it. Uh, these guys, these little crystals are the culprit of the most common vestibular disorder called BPPV or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. These are small crystal-like structures uh, that we're born with. They don't regenerate. What we're born with is what we've got. We don't grow new ones and we certainly don't ever run out of them. They're similar to the makeup of what our bones or even more closely related to the makeup of limestone. So just like our bones over time or limestone over time, they can, be, they can break down and they can become fragile and, and also flake off. Yeah, so once again, we're going with the same theme, small but mighty. The otoconia are sensitive to gravity and if they dislodge from their home in one of the otolith organs called the utricle, they can end up in another aspect of the inner ear, which we previously mentioned, one of the semicircular canals. And when they do this, they really trick you into thinking you're moving when you're not. So most often patients will report a sense of room spinning vertigo with positional changes, such as moving from an upright seated position to then lying down. If the otoconia are dislodged, vertigo shouldn't come on with movements that don't change the position of the vestibular apparatus with respect to gravity. So for example, if you're seated upright and you shake your head no, the vestibular apparatus with respect to gravity is staying the same. So that room spinning sensation should not come on. However, if you were to look up to reach something off a high shelf or if you were to bend over to tie your shoes, Whole nother story. Whole nother story. And there's, I can actually show you this little model here and we can depict how these little crystals move around these little canals. So just to kind of give 
people a little visual if you're if you're watching on YouTube. We've got our hearing organ. We've got our little semicircular canals up top. And then we've got the little home where the crystals live in this area. So say we develop some crystals in one of these canals here. Every time you were to look up and those crystals move or bend forward and those crystals move or get up out of bed or lie down in bed, they're going to cause that, that canal to fire when it shouldn't, making your brain think you're moving. So when those crystals be get, become dislodged and they enter in the canals, they have a really hard time finding their way back to where they belong naturally. One of the only ways to get the crystals from the bottom of the canal back where they belong would be if you are doing backflips on a daily basis, <laughs> right? which I don't think anybody's doing normally. So the reason for this is because these crystals are a one-way street. They go in one direction, but they meet a roadblock at the bottom. They just don't simply move back into the apparatus. This little roadblock at the bottom is a little uh, piece of gelatinous material that's actually the sensor to sense where that motion is going and send the signals to the brain. And that little sensor is made up of some gelatinous material, just like the organ that those little otoconias sit in and get stuck on. So this could be actually be a, a huge problem. If crystals make it to that little uh, sensor sometimes, they can become stuck, which creates a more rare form of beep and BV and that becomes a little bit harder to treat. But now more specifically in beep and BV, when the otoconia end up in the part of the inner ear that it doesn't belong, which is a semicircular canal, they cause fluid in the canal or endolymph to move. This fluid, which fills the whole apparatus, is meant to move, and it's the, the angular acceleration of that movement that creates the excitatory or inhibitory response that's supposed to happen. But otoconia, uh, they actually make it even move when they're not supposed to be moving. So this causes that spinning sensation. It changes the pressure in the canal if they're moving through there, and it creates that sensor to fire when it shouldn't. But knowing a little bit more about anatomy now, it does make a lot of sense why we have activities involving movement um, provoke our symptoms. So let's break this down. If I turn my head to the right, like Abby discussed before, and my right horizontal canal sends an excitatory input to my brain, while my left horizontal canal sends an, an inhibitory input to my brain, then what happens if one of those inner ears isn't working properly? Yeah, and now all of a sudden, those equal and opposite inputs are no longer accurate. And now your brain is having a harder time accurately comprehending these inputs from the peripheral vestibular system or the vestibular apparatus, anything outside your brain. Mm -hmm. And with the confusion, well, you guessed it, you become dizzy, unsteady, you might be nauseated, whatever symptoms you usually experience. Mm -hmm. So Abby, can we talk about a little bit more of a fun topic that everybody might be able to relate to at least at some point in their life regarding their vestibular system? Hmm, Danny, I have no idea what you're talking about. Zero experience over here. Well, I'm thinking more about those late nights in college <laughs> or out and having a good time, not keeping track of the drinks that we're drinking and something terrible happens. Okay, so I would be willing to bet that if you're listening to this podcast, you might have experienced this once in your life, maybe just once, if you're lucky, once. Just once. And that's when, you know, you come home from a night out, you lie down, and you experience something happening with your vestibular system. You experience the spins. Oh, they're the worst, and you feel nauseated, you feel terrible, and... It's actually your vestibular system that's causing this. The alcohol that you're drinking all night actually gets into the vestibular apparatus and changes the density of the fluid, sending everything into just chaos. Pure chaos. So what do you do? You add another sensory input by putting your foot on the floor. Or staring at the horizon. I always felt if I could just keep my eye on that light, that smoke detector light across the room, <laughs> I did much, much better. <laughs> So, Danny, you're speaking from experience. Only once. We talked about only once. <laughs> well, I will say, there, so for all of you who might not have experienced this, there is another way you can stimulate the vestibular organ without all of the fun, and that is with ice water. And I've had this happen oh, to yeah. me once when I was studying with Jeff Walter up in Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the first days on clinical, he says, you need to sympathize with your patients. And I said, well, what the heck does that mean? And he had me lie on a table and he poured ice water in my ear. 
And the temperature of the water changes the specific density of the fluid in the horizontal canal. And with about 10 seconds, the room was spinning. I saw the ceiling tiles start to move and I tried to balance, walk across the room and felt like an idiot, <laughs> followed by a headache and some nausea without any of the fun, you know, from hours before. But oh, uh, man. one way that you can, you can trigger that response as well. So changing the density of the fluid, either with temperature or with alcohol is one way that you can experience vertigo. It is not a fun experience to say the very least. Not at all. And, you know, while we're on the topic of Jeff Walter, mm -hmm. we want to share with you guys that Jeff Walter will be coming on the show soon to discuss 10 things we may not know about vestibular anatomy. So we touched the surface today. We gave you a little synopsis on what the vestibular system is and how it affects our everyday life. We're, gonna, we're going to talk about a few more details in another episode. And if you are a practicing clinician and you liked some of the models that you saw today that we use for our patient education, you can find them on vestibular.today in the shop. We've got keychains, we've got all different fun stuff, um, but we also have bigger models for patients to kind of wrap their, their minds around the, um, the aspect of what the vestibular organ is, as well as the little tiny true to size prints just to show how small but mighty this thing is. I use them in every initial evaluation. They're the best. And light also, when I'm, what's that? It's like that light bulb moment. They can, they can picture it. They can see it. It's, it's easier to, to figure out. Yes, very much so. And then I also want to mention, don't forget to follow us on Instagram, vestibular.today and Balancing Act Rehab. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you. If you're interested in finding us on social media or the web, you can visit www.vestibular.today for more resources, including testing, treatment, and educational videos, blogs, continuing education classes, and resources, including clinic equipment recommendations, suggested tests, and BPBV treatment charts. Search Vestibular Today and Balancing Neck Rehab on all social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Also, be sure to check out Balancing Act Rehab at www.balancingactrehab.com, especially if you think you would benefit from vestibular therapy. We are your girls. The information on this podcast is not intended to replace the care provided by your qualified health professional or to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on Talk Dizzy to Me. Please contact us at Balancing Act Rehab if you think you could benefit from vestibular therapy.